This afternoon, I have the distinct honor and privilege to, uh, to introduce our uh, next speaker, who is a good friend of Docs for Patient Care, a good friend of Direct Primary Care, a good friend of mine, um, Grace Marie Turner. She is the president and the CEO of the Galen Institute, which is a uh, free market public policy research organization. Um, but more, I, I can read the bio, but I'm just going to tell you what, what I want to tell you. There's really very few people in this country who understand health care and who can speak about it extemporaneously, um, as can Grace Marie. And she's um, consequently in great demand on TV, on radio, on um, on, uh, in, in print media, she's um, involved in the policy world, but most importantly, she is a member of the advisory board of the Docs for Patient Care Foundation. So I'm not gonna take up any more of her time, I'm going to introduce her, and she's going to speak to us about the policy impacting the delivery of care. So Grace Marie. Thank you. Hi everybody. It's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to be here and see the fabulous spirit in this, uh, this conference and with the hope and promise that you all see in really taking back American medicine to the centrality of the doctor-patient relationship. I founded the Galen Institute 20 years ago because I felt it was tremendously important for public policy decisions to be made around that doctor-patient relationship, not around bureaucracies, not around politicians deciding how medicine should be practiced, but around what you and your patients decide is best for them. And as you can tell, it is a Sisyphean battle um, I do think that had we not been in this game, it would be even worse that the, I, the ideas around consumer-directed health care, some of the platforms that um, really are helping to allow this to catch, ho catch hold, like health savings accounts, really are something that we have worked and advocated for, and there are a lot of other things that we have on the agenda. I was at a meeting last, a couple of weeks ago, with Seema Verma, the new administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that I know a lot from her work uh, with Healthy Indiana program in Indiana and other things that she has done to try to bring some free market ideas to the Medicaid space. And she brought up direct primary care. We were gonna do it, there's just se several of us there, including a former CMS administrator, former CBO director, and she was the one who said, this is so interesting and we're going to try to figure out how we can make this work in public programs. So this is really uh, an idea whose time has not only come, but, but long past, and I'm really pleased to see so many of you here really advancing this. What I'm going to be talking about today is sort of the 30,000 foot view of where we are in the health sector, where we are with the health reform debate, what's likely to happen next, because I think that all of these forces and all of these decisions that are being made in Washington, unfortunately, still do affect the health sector. The government spending is now half of all health spending in the country, and obviously it directs a lot of the rest of it. So let's talk a little bit about where we are. And, you know, we all basically start out on the same platform that we believe everybody should have health coverage as they define what that is, that the coverage should be affordable, that quality care should be protected, that people should have choices of physicians and treatments and insurers, and most importantly, that government programs should be established and should be operated to protect the most vulnerable. People who really don't have any place else to go for care should be the primary function of government and get out of the way for everybody else. But you can see what a difficult battle this is. And one of the reasons that this has been that the Obamacare, I'm gonna use that term because President Obama, former President Obama said, fine to call it Obamacare. That, that Obamacare has been so unpopular is because people have so personally felt its negative effects on their, on their life. Starting out, 
one of the reasons that Congress is having so much trouble repealing it is that there really has been a major reduction in the number of uninsured. We started out with 44 million people without health insurance before the ACA went into effect. 20, 28 million were uninsured in 2016, so that's 16 million more people that now have health coverage than did before the law was enacted and before they spent a trillion dollars. Um, getting it, um, it on, on new subsidies. But when you look at where this coverage is, almost all of it, almost all of the net coverage has been in Medicaid. 89% of the new, when you do all the math of who lost coverage, who uh, private coverage, who lost employer coverage, who got it in the exchanges or not, most of the net coverage, nine out of 10 people, have gotten coverage through Medicaid. And so we really made We've, made, we've done so much to disrupt the private health market for very little net gain in private coverage. And you can see 1.7 million more people now have private coverage than did before the, um, before the law passed. Eight and a half million people are receiving subsidies through the exchanges, almost nine million are getting coverage through the exchanges but they're not subsidized. About three and a half million people have actually net on net lost job based coverage. So 1.7 million, and that's likely to go down as the prices of health insurance go up and more people who aren't subsidized drop out. So this huge disruption is really one of the reasons that people are saying we have to do something about this law. Effects of the individual mandate. As we all know, that's probably the most unpopular part of this law. The individual mandate um, affected about 24 million people who didn't, weren't on Medicare, weren't on Medicaid, didn't have job-based coverage, didn't buy coverage through the exchanges, 23 and a half million people. Of that, about six and a half million people just paid the penalty, said, I'm, I'm just not gonna buy health insurance, just take the money out of my tax refund. Another 12 million, 13 million almost, got a hardship exemption. And under the Obama administration, they were pretty easy to get. If you had trouble paying a utility bill, you could be exempt from the individual mandate. They've tightened some of those rules since then. But another four, four million people, more than four million, just basically blew it off and said, I'm not paying the penalty. I'm not buying health insurance, and I'm not even reporting that I don't have health insurance. So when you see Americans basically say, this law is not working for me, and you've still got 23 million people uninsured, even though this was supposed to be universal coverage, clearly it's not achieving its goals. So Congress has failed four times this year to pass legislation to repeal the law. So are they giving up? The answer is no. And that's because, even though they've turned to tax reform for the moment, they are very worried about being primaried. The, especially the Republicans, there are a number of, uh, of all Republican members of the House will be up, and about a dozen members of the, uh, Republican members of the Senate are up for re-election in 2018. And they have been telling voters, most of them, for four election cycles, that if you elect me, we'll repeal Obamacare. Well, having failed four times, they don't want to go back to the voters and just say, I'm sorry, it was just too hard. So they have to try again. And I, I think they're going to be trying again uh, early next year. And I'll talk with you a little bit about what I think the shape of that legislation may look like. And I think it may be something that you find to be favorable for your view of the world as well. So we've, one of the reasons, that in addition to the political motivation, that they know they've got to do something is because people are facing such huge cost increases because of Obamacare. Since 2013, individual premiums are up almost 100%. Family premiums are up 140% for traditional insurance. You all, everybody has a family member. Everybody has seen it. You all have seen it directly. And insurers are planning many more tax hikes for 2018. In Florida, the average hike in is going to be 45%. I just saw this morning with some plans 71% higher this year over last year. And you see some of the other numbers there. It's um, it's unaffordable to, to more and more people. And increasingly, 
people don't even have a choice of plans. Wasn't that one of the things that President Obama promised? You can like keep, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Everybody's gonna save $2,500 a year in your health premiums. People will have more, almost half of Americans who are eligible for subsidies in the, in the Obamacare exchanges are going to have a choice of one plan, really take it or leave it. So that's not really what they were promised, and they're going to be paying huge prices and huge costs for that. The, um, and here are some of the numbers. It started out with a lot of hope and promise that people would be able to have more choices. In 2015, only 6% of counties had one choice, and now we're up to 50%. And with this new announcement today about cost-sharing reduction payments, we'll talk about that in a minute, that's um, going to actually drive more insurers out of the market. So Congress's three-pronged plan to address Obamacare started with repeal and replace. It actually started just with repeal. Then it was repeal and replace. And as you saw the title, repeal, replace, repair, retreat, you know, it's really been hard to figure out where they're going. But right now, they have been talking about bipartisan efforts to stabilize the markets, whatever that means. That means throwing more federal government money at them. Um, but there still is an effort to come up with a better plan that learns from the experience of this year with this very, very, very broad and fractured caucus in the, on, even on the Republican side, which is writing the legislation because they control both houses of Congress, that can take advantage of the lessons we've learned from that and try to give people more choices and more options. Regulatory action, that's really now stepping up into high gear. We saw that on Thursday, President Trump signed an executive order that we'll talk about it again in a few minutes, but, and then again today, basically using the administration's authority to say we're not gonna be making these illegal cost sharing reduction payments to insurers. So they're really going to think about what can we do through regulatory action if Congress is just dragging its feet to get this uh, over the finish line. And then finally, they're looking at some things that they think might get bipartisan support so that they could get enough Democrats. You have to have 60 uh, votes in the Senate under regular order to get legislation passed. And they're hoping they might, they need, would need, they had kept all Republicans, all 52, they'd still need eight Democrats to join them. And they're looking at things like repealing the Independent Payment, pay, Independent Payment Advisory Board. That's the board that's supposed to cut Medicare payments if they go over a certain threshold. It has no judicial review. It has really basically no congressional review. They are unelected, and it's really almost impossible for citizens to petition them to, uh, if they don't like their decisions. I worry about this Independent Payment Advisory Board because it is, it is what Bernie Sanders would need if he were to ha get his single-payer health care system. Somebody to make the decision sort of outside the political realm about cutting payments to doctors and hospitals. This is not good. And actually, the Demo there's broad Democratic support to get rid of it as well. Tax credits available to people to keep their COBRA insurance, veterans benefits, um, medical liability reform is something they think, um, they, actually it's, been, it's passed the House, whether or not that can get through the Senate is another big question. And they've also passed some legislation to try to help small businesses. So there's an effort to continue these small bills that you really don't hear much about, but they are continuing to um, try to make this work, but it's been sort of a car wreck so far. And this little clip, I'll show you in just a minute, seems to really, to me, uh, well, first here, repeal or replace legislation, um, American Health Care Act passed May 3rd in the House, Senate failed July 28th, and then again September 26th. So here's where I think this is taking us. Ah, uh, skipped it. We got to go back. I worked really hard on this. Let's see. I can make this work. Yeah, here we go. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> Does that sort of feel like what it is like? You know, think of, how could we not pass this? And then here we do this. 
So by the way, if this PowerPoint is helpful to any of you for any of your work and presentations or the slides are useful to you, just send me a note uh, at gracemarie at galen.org. I've got some cards down here also, and I'll be happy to send it to you. It's not proprietary, and if it's something that would be useful to you, any of these slides, that would be happy to share it with you. So let's look at what was in this legislation, because that's really what the conversation is going to be about, certainly for the rest of this Congress, and also, I think, moving forward, if um, they're the part of the power structure in Washington doesn't change. So importantly, and I think people don't really realize this, they said, you know, we know we've got these 16, 18 million people now getting subsidies through Obamacare. We can't just throw them out in the street. So we've got to provide a safety net. Medicaid expansion would have uh, continued but, but expired 2020 in the House, 2024 in the Senate. People could still stay on Medicaid but without these enormously generous federal matches. Providing subsidies for people with uh, the private, um, private insurance through the exchanges. And then the House bill would have allowed refundable tax credits for a family of up to $14,000 a year to purchase health insurance. Who's heard that before? Nobody's heard it. You've heard it, good for you. But very few people understand that there was a lot of money in these bills to help people continue to purchase health insurance. I know it's not the health insurance that you and all I want them to be have, but we've got to start where we are and build a better system. And if you can provide people with more flexibility in the ways that they get coverage, then that provides openings for things like DPPC, DPC and other, other creative ideas that are out there to help people have more control over their health care decisions. The House and Senate bills also would have repealed almost all the trillion dollars in taxes that the Obamacare raised. The Cadillac tax delayed young adults staying in their parents' policies, repealed the individual and employer mandates. Individual mandate, the Congressional Budget Office seems to think has these magical powers, we'll talk about that in a minute, but repealed both of them, and giving states much more flexibility, both in providing people with more options for different kind of health insurance programs, as well as uh, how they organize their Medicaid programs and then protections for pre-existing conditions. I'll talk about that. So the Graham Cassidy Heller Johnson bill, that was the one that came one vote short on September 26th in the Senate and probably would have passed the House, um, just told their nose and, and just, you know, they wouldn't have loved it, but it was a different concept where most of the, the bills that had come before that were based on the same kind of funding structure as Obamacare. Federal refundable tax credits to help people buy private insurance through the exchanges. But this was different. It said, no, that's not what we're gonna do. We're going to get rid of the mandates, we're gonna get rid of the in, um, individual mandate and employment pen penalties. They can't really touch the regulation itself because of this convoluted reconciliation process they have to use to pass it, but they could have gotten rid of the penalties, so individual mandate stays in place, but we're not gonna collect any of those, uh, any of those penalty amounts. It would have repealed some of the taxes, not all of them, but most importantly, it would have devolved funding to the states, both for the, for the help for people in purchasing private health insurance, as well as for giving people on Medicaid more options and giving states more flexibility in how they spend their Medicaid dollars. So this whole idea of federalism, really, federal government has proven, if nothing else in Obamacare, that it is completely out of its league in trying to manage the health insurance market devolving it back to the states, which at least have they have decades of experience in regulating health insurance. Maybe we have a lot of problems with that, and we do. I think the American people, though, are better informed and better educated now about how all of these little provisions that states have put on mandates on health insurance have increased their costs. So the citizens, I think, would be more engaged next time in helping to make sure they have more choices. 
So we'll just take a little quick dive into what some of these, this, you heard 22 million people would be without coverage if any of these Republican bills passed. That's because the CBO thinks that the individual mandate has magical powers. It said just because the individual mandate goes away, 14 million people would drop coverage. Not because the subsidies weren't generous enough, but because the individual man, the federal government would no longer be compelling you to purchase the coverage that it says we need. They just say five million people would just suddenly drop out of Medicaid. Doesn't cost them anything, but there's no individual mandate, so they drop out. Two million employer coverage and six million out of the exchanges. So you can see that this is just sort of detached from reality, and this was a, a comparison between what the CBO was said was going to happen under Obamacare as far as coverage numbers and what actually did. And they missed it by about a factor of two and a half. And it's actually that 10.4 that numbers inflated because that's the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, fewer people have paid their premium. It's really about $8 million at the end of the year. So um, replacing the individual mandate, I want to go quickly through this. People waited to purchase coverage. Uh, until they needed care, they were going to get some sort of penalties. In the Senate bill, they would um, be um, charged for a, have a six-month waiting period before they could buy coverage. And in the House, they'd have to pay 30% more. So, you know, different kinds of ways of encouraging people to stay covered. Pre-existing conditions, federal protections would have remained. States could have only um, gotten rid of these if they had a better idea. So what comes next? I had, used to have a picture of Dr. Price there, and I'm so sorry Dr. Price is not here with us to this weekend because he was um, scheduled, as you know, to speak and would have really been, he's such a passionate, powerful advocate for the kinds of creative doctor-patient-centric uh, practice methods that you all are living and supporting. And I know that he will, he will find a new place where I'm sure he can have an important voice, but it's really just terribly unfortunate that he's taken the fall for all of these failures in Congress so far to pass legislation. So um, an executive order announced yesterday I think is very interesting. Basically, it's is saying that an association, like a truckers association, for example, if it has members of truckers uh, in different states, it can set up a health plan that basically works under ERISA, where they can decide what benefits they want to offer and not have to be under the Obamacare thumb. Um, access to temporary health insurance policy. Sometimes people need a policy between jobs or between, you know, they're setting up a company and they can't quite afford yet to purchase health insurance. The Obama administration decided that they were only going to allow temporary health insurance policies for three months. Well, the, the, the Trump administration says, no, we'll allow people to have a policy for a year. And then finally, allowing people to use money from their health reimbursement arrangements, which are kind of like HSAs, but they're set up by employers, that they can use that money to pay for premiums. And I think we also need to make sure that the regulations, because this isn't going to be legislation, this is regulations, that that money could also be used to pay DPC premiums. So I think there are lots of ways in which there's some creative options possible from this new uh, executive order. It's going to take time for the, for the agencies, the Labor Department, the Treasury Department, Health and Human Services, all have to write rules and they have to go out for public comment, they have to accept the public comment and then issue the final rule before it can happen. So we're talking certainly months, but I think that we can see the approach is to give people more choices and more flexibility. And then this. You know, there's also all the criticism that, oh my goodness, they're, they're, they're discouraging people from enrolling. Well, they decided that they weren't going to pay these navigators. These are people who have virtually no experience in enrolling people in, in health insurance. But they're paying $62.5 million last year for these really community organizers to go out and try to get people enrolled in health insurance. One got $200,000 and enrolled one person. 
And so HHS says, this is not good enough. We're going to cut this program in half, and we're going to make sure that your payment is appropriate to your performance. But they get hammered for this, even though one, one navigator, it wasn't just one person, this was a, an organization that had signed up to enroll people in Obamacare, $200,000, and they only got one person enrolled. So not good enough. Power of the states, um, the HHS is also looking at a lot of these state innovation waivers. What can states do to give people more choices, more options? take the same federal money, but spend it in a way that they think would work better for their, for their citizens. Um, the statute requires the, the states to provide at least as good of coverage, but even the ACA hasn't provided as good of coverage as it was promised. So we've got to really redefine the terms here, and that's another thing that HHS is working on, particularly SEMA. And as I said, she's very interested in direct primary care. So um, maybe we can have a conversation about ways that you can help me understand more about ways other than allowing, um, she's looking at ways that, that direct primary care could be an option for primary care for people on Medicaid. Are there other ideas that we might offer her as a way of trying to, I'm, I know you don't want government money here involved because that is exactly what you're trying to get away from, but if this model, it's a sort of a proof of concept, if this model can take hold, then I think it really can get the, even more traction than it has now in getting people to understand what's possible here. And these are, could be state-based pilots primarily. She's looking for pilot programs. So I just put this up here as a reminder of this horrible mess that we were in in our health sector. When this first was produced by a, an employee of the Joint Economic Committee in, in Washington, I thought, oh my goodness, what a horrible maze. The worst part is I now understand all of it. It's really not good, you know. And look here, I don't think I have a, um, a laser here, but look where patients are, way down in the bottom right corner. Sorry guys, like if I come over there, then it, the camera gets all screwed up, so I can't come over there to show you, but you see it right down on the, on the right. And then over on the left, bottom, you can barely see it, physicians. Congress is way up here on the left. President, the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, of which there is not one now, there's an act, acting secretary, has huge powers to distribute this trillion dollars of money. And obviously, all of it is connected with the kind of red tape that you all are doing such a good job of really trying to find a way to escape, not an understanding, I understand, it's very difficult to change this system. We're not going to change it all at once. But if we can start to make some changes around the margins, this model is so powerful, free market ideas are so powerful, that they will get traction, and we don't have to write tens of thousands of pages of rules and regulations to implement legislation. We just need to throw the seeds out there so that they really flourish. That's what you're doing, that's what I'm trying to do in Washington to try to help generate public policy ideas and, and legislation that can really make this ground more fertile for a system that conjoins the doctor-patient relationship in a much more effective way. So um, send me a note, gracemarie at galen.org, if you have any ideas if you have um, suggestions, if you want me to introduce you to any of the people in Washington who are um, coming up with ideas about how to create pilot programs, I would be more than happy to, to talk with you. So I think that we have a few minutes for questions, Hal, yes? Yes. yes. So I, it's hard for me to see out there, but oh, and we have microphones, excellent. Ah, wonderful. So yes, please, please tell us who you are and yeah. then we'll. I'm Dr. Chad Savage. Yes, yes. Um, a quick question about medical loss ratio. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of in the weeds on policy, but I see that as a great inhibition to the insurance companies ever being on our side. Yeah. Um, medical loss ratio, for those of you who don't know, is part of ACA, and it sounds well intended because it limits the amount of a premium an insurance company can keep for themselves to usually about 20%, depends on the exact type of policy. Yeah. 
but an example of that is if there is a policy that's a million dollar policy twenty percent of that policy can go to the insurance company for administrative uh... costs so two hundred thousand dollars eight hundred thousand dollars has to be paid out for medical costs the reason this is a concern is because anything that truly um, has an opportunity to, to innovate in the system and reduce costs. Let's say, for example, it reduced it to $100,000. Some great innovation like direct primary care comes along. Well, now that means that that insurance company can only collect 20% of $100,000. So they only, this actually is death to them. So unfortunately, insurance companies are put in a weird situation where they kind of have to talk out of both sides of their mouth. For political purposes, they have to talk a good game of that they're trying to reduce costs. And yet, if they actually do, they're harmed by that. Is there any movement to look at removing that rule? The medical loss ratio really hasn't really been on the table, mostly because it's, it's a rule, it's a regulation. It's mm -hmm. not a direct spending provision, so it's not reachable through this reconciliation process they have to use to pass legislation. But it's certainly on our radar screen. And that's, that exact, that's exactly the problem with health savings accounts, for example. They don't want to sell less expensive catastrophic policies because that reduces their premium revenue. So this has to, once again, be a bottom-up movement. It has to be what kind of insurance do people need when they are a DPC patron, yeah. you know, patient? What do they need to do how do we need to reconfigure health insurance outside the ACA model? Just the, the comment being, though, if there's any way to address this, and I don't know the yeah. policy aspects, it may take um, some people who may be our adversaries and, and make them less so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. Good point. Thank you very much. Yes. Hello. My name's Peter. I'm trying to understand where all that money is going to from, uh, you know, the the Medicaid expansion you said covered most, or was most of the insurance coverage expansion, but the government keeps bailing out commercial insurance in the exchanges, right? Right. So where, how's that math work out? Because it doesn't seem to make sense to me. If they're already paying for most of the expansion through Medicaid, why do they continue to need to pour even more money into the commercial insurers in the well, as I, this is net increase, right? 1.7 mm -hmm. million. A lot of people have lost both private policies and job-based coverage. So you still do have, you know, 9 to 10 million people in the exchanges on getting subsidized coverage and, and about that many more. But that on net, the increase is only 1.7 million. Most of the money is going to, uh, most of the net increases in Medicaid. But these subsidies are very expensive in the exchanges. You know, people are getting you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year in some cases for the most expensive policies, the biggest families who have the lowest incomes who qualify, plus these cost sharing reduction subsidies. So they don't have to pay these huge deductibles and the big co-payments that are written into the policy, but people are protected from that. So this is there is a huge amount of money sloshing through the system to really prop up a system that is just it's just not working for, for millions of people. But most of that money is going, some of the money is, is, states are putting some of the money on the table for their part of the Medicaid expansion. It's a small number for the expansion populations, but obviously they also have to pay for their regular Medicaid patients. So it's, you know, you can see that all of this is just a huge amount of money, but there still is a lot of money that's being spent through the exchanges, even though there's a very small net increase in private coverage. Right. Thank you. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Um, one of the biggest barriers that probably a lot of us have faced in trying to reduce costs is the giant, I don't know how much that yeah, costs, know, right. and the evil dark veil of secrecy that they all hide behind. Is there some movement for price transparency? Um, yeah. It doesn't cost $2,000 to do an MRI, but nobody knows how much it costs when you call. Um, mm -hmm. It was mentioned that the High Tech Act says they have to offer a cash price. Um, that is like pulling all of your teeth out to get to eventually sometimes. Um, so I think that's a real, if you want the consumer to be able to shop healthcare, you can't do it without a price. Yeah. And That's so, so uh, right. I hear, I hear a lot from members saying that we need price transparency just like we have in the rest of the economy. But until consumers are demanding 
that information because they're going to benefit from the cost savings. It's very hard to get politicians to pay attention. That's why we need these new insurance models. That's why health savings accounts, for example, are effective because up to whatever deductible they have chosen, they are responsible for those costs. And, and you hear stories about a, a public opinion poll about health savings accounts and why people are more likely to get preventive care if they have HSAs. And they said, well, you know what I've learned is if I take better care of myself, I save money. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to get to in this. And so you've, but you've got to get an incentive put in there. And the more people are protected from every single cost, and it's all sloshing through this big, gigantic pool of insurance money, the less they see that and the less they demand it. So I, it's, it's got to start from consumers needing that information because they've got a different policy structure. And then having a few pockets of people who figure out how to do this a tra that starts to be something that, that really catches hold. It's not going to be something that Washington legislates. That's going to turn into price controls if they do it. It's got to be from the bottom up. Yes, sir. Hi, Grace. Me. My name is Brad Reedy. I was Hi, just Brad. wondering if there is um, any appetite in Washington for um, separating or divorcing the employer from a payment of health care mm -hmm. and can we do anything to help move that along because that would be really key for for us moving forward such a good question I actually one of the key one of the key goals of the health of the Galen Institute and many of my colleagues in the policy community is to try to separate health insurance from the workplace. It's one of the reasons we have so many millions of people uninsured because they don't have the option of employer-based coverage. How can you equalize the tax treatment? The, the tax break that people get for having employer-based health insurance is much larger than the mortgage interest deduction, and they don't even know they get it. All of the income that goes to health insurance is protected from taxes. And as a result, people demand more and more health insurance, more and more generous policies at work, including very low deductibles, because they think their employer is paying for it. Their employer is not paying for it. They're taking it out of their compensation package. It's one of the reasons that wages have been relatively flat over the last 10 years. But it's protected from taxes, so they never know they get it. So equalizing the tax treatment of health insurance is something that is, continues to be on our agenda, and it's something we actually have some bipartisan support for. But this provision in the executive order that the president signed yesterday that would begin the process of giving people who have health reimbursement arrangements the opportunity to spend that money the way they want to spend it is really an important start. So an employer could say, you know, we've been buying you this Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for five years. Instead of that, we are going to buy you a catastrophic policy and we're going to put $5,000 a year into your health reimbursement arrangement. And you will very likely then care a lot more about how, that, how much that MRI costs because you're gonna see that price. You may say, you know, I really wanna use that up, use that money, some of that money to sign up for a DPC practice as a, as a participant in that model. So people would then, or somebody else may say, you know, my wife has a really good offer of a policy at work. Does it make any sense for us to be on different policies? What we want to do is use some of that money to help pay the premiums for her policy for the family. So you can see that those kinds of things could really begin to generate a lot more ideas and a lot more options for people, just starting with something that's kind of below the radar screen that gives employers a different option. But I absolutely agree with you. We've got, to, we've got to get people on the outside the same kind of options that people on the inside have. And then people on the outside can have health savings accounts maybe also funded through you know, some of this tax subsidy money if they're in an income category that qualifies for it. So creating those models, I think, is very important. So I see how, give me the hook. Not really, um, no, I, I just thanks. wanted to. I thought that uh, we would ask if there are any other questions, and if not, I was just going to 
Thank you, Grace Marie. I think that this is such an incredibly difficult issue. The um, everything that you you discussed just underscores how convoluted this is, how upside down the whole system is. And as I always say, as, as I've written, you know, healthcare can be thought of as a super highway. And, um, and it's clogged with traffic. And I just want to see them open up an express lane for people in this room to do what they want to do. And, and if, they, if, if that express lane is opened up for patients to be traveling in that lane, everybody will want to travel in that lane, and that's the, the problem. Nobody in Washington, nobody in the special interest community wants to allow people to travel in that superhighway express lane. So everybody's going to have their work cut out for them. We're not going to see a revolution. We're going to see an evolution from the ground up, and I think this is, this, you all are the, are the ones who are going to lead that. Um, Grace Marie, thank you so thank much you for being here and, and for sharing your information from Washington.